pass you over to uh, the lovely Jim Roche. Now, hello there. This is based on a talk that I did as a volunteer at the museum to the Tully Body History Society or History Group. And so it explores the origins of the Argyles territorial force and then looks at the end of the Great War because I did the talk in uh, 2018, the year, 100 years after the end of the Great War. And the Argyles were formed in 1881 between the 91st Highlanders and the 93rd Highlanders. And they kept their numbers to them as part of their cultural heritage. And these are some um, recruitment posters from the early weeks of the Great War. You can see the Argyles with their red and white dicing and their huge big cap badge on the Glengarry. Next, please. <coughs> I'm going to look at uh, how the Great War in influenced words that we use today. Look at Tully Body. Look at armies in 1914 um, and how small the British Army was. Look at Kitchener's efforts and talk about popular opinion. Um, then about trench life. And I'll look at some of the technical developments um, in the British Army using the artillery as a way of thinking about things and then talk about the final victory in 100 days. Next, please. The British soldiers couldn't speak French, and when they wanted a bottle of vin blanc, they called it a bottle of plonk. So we still call a cheap bottle of wine a bottle of plonk. When the Churchill's idea of uh, a moving strong point was developed into an armoured vehicle. They were shipped across to France, covered up in uh, canvas. Um, and it was said that they were water tanks. So we still call these armoured vehicles tanks. And soldiers going over the top was climbing out of the trench and running. Um, and we still use the term, that's a bit over the top. A sniper was someone who was a very good shot and could shoot a snipe. Shrapnel comes from the Napoleonic War, um, but it became popularized within wider society uh, as the, the balls that come out of the, small balls of lead that come out of shells that are exploded overhead. There's a series of uh, Indian names that came into wider society. So they were used in the army um, that rotated through India. And one of them is chit, which is a small piece of paper that you write something on. I used to use chat and chatting as an example. Um, I'm not sure it's true, but it was said that chatting was um, burning off the knits. A chat was a knit, and two friends would sit there with a, a lighter and burn them out of each other's uniform, and that's where chatting comes from, but that might not be true. Uh, Blighty is a faraway place, so you get a blighty one, you get to go home. Cushy number is an easy job. And um, talk about a cup of char. And that's interesting because the language in China on the coastal provinces, the name for tea begins with a t sound. On the inland provinces, the name for tea begins with a ch. And so Britain got its tea over land, no, by sea. Um, so it's got a test sound, we call it tea. But in India, um, they got it over land. So it begins with a cha. So that's why you get chai and cha and all that. And the last one is bumf. Next one, Ross. Um, bumf is paperwork from senior headquarters that's called bum fodder. So I've got a load of bump on the desk. Looking at Tully Body, um, one of the things that, st that started the whole um, territorial force off was the rifle volunteers, which was people gathering together, men gathering together to form units to defend the country. And that is the rifle volunteers group that were set up 
in this area. Next, please. The uniform looks very like a Confederate Army soldier. And it's always struck me that um, the, the Scottish rifle volunteers chose uniforms that looked very like the Confederate soldiers in the, uh, the American Civil War. And there's lots of other things going around. The flag, the Confederate battle flag is based on um, the Scotland saltire. And we even have hillbillies um, who come from Scotland. And if you think, where does the whiskey come from in America? It comes from the southern states. Next, please. These are other Confederate soldiers. And if you look at the Austrian knot on the officer's sleeve, that's repeated on the sleeve of the rifle volunteers from this area. Uh, the Confederates called them chicken guts. Next, please. This whole thing started because of a, a, an invasion scare in 1859. Uh, Napoleon III was going to invade Britain. And so these local groups were formed and they got their uniforms and rifles and marching about to deter the French. And that's where some of these coastal defences were built at the time. Next, please. So instead of having random groups of people wandering around and forming dining societies and firing at things, um, the Lords Lieutenants were given the, the job of forming them into a, a structure. The members paid for their uniforms. And on the 4th of November, 1859, in Tullybody, the first meeting of the Clackman and Volunteer Rifle Corps occurred. Um, it was then formed into an administrative battalion, AB, you'll see it in a minute, um, 1867. And then in 1888, it became the seventh volunteer battalion of the Argyles. Next, please. So that's the sequence of uniforms as you see them going along. So you go from the Confederate grey with the kepi to a, still a grey uniform, but with tartan trousers, trues, then a red coat, and then finally a uniform that's like the Argyle uniform at the time. Next, please. Um, this is a restructure that happens at the time of Haldane. Now, Haldane was um, Minister of War or similar. He was born in Edinburgh, and he served as Minister of War in Campbell Bannerman's government. He's the chap in Stirling who's got his big statue up near the War Monument and who paid for the... Um, the observatory in the Highland Hotel. It became part of the Argyle Brigade of the 1st Highland Territorial Division and these men would meet once a week on a Wednesday evening or something and they would have a two-week camp every year and sometimes that would be the only time that men in the West would get off the island next. This is the cap badge that was designed when the regiment was formed in 1881 from the original 91st and 93rd and it's the biggest cap badge in the British Army ever um, and if you look at it on the left um, there's a, a wild boar that's from Argyle and the Campbells and on the right there's a wild cat from Clanchatton in Sutherland and if you know your um, Culloden, you'll know that these two clans fought on either side. And if you look at the red dicing on the bottom uh, column, the, the, the Argyles uniquely had red and white dicing only, not red and blue or red and black or red and green. You'll see that they're connected to the middle row forming a red line because it was the Argyles who formed the thin red line in the Crimean War. Next, please. The badge was designed by Princess Louise, who was the first uh, royal colonel of the regiment. And she um, was named after her father, Prince Albert, and her middle name's Alberta. And when they were looking for names in Canadian provinces, um, she, she had one named after her, and also the beautiful Lake Louise. If you've ever been to 
Canada and gone to Lake Louise. It's called Louise Atterha. Next, please. One of the striking things about the start of the Great War is the size of the armies. These are regular armies. And <clears throat> the British army is less than 250,000 strong and is spread around the world. These other continental armies are um, in the millions and are only in their own countries. Now, Britain was relying on a powerful navy and a very small army. And so a decision to intervene in continental Europe had pretty big and significant influences on what happened in Britain. The other thing to remember is that the continental armies had conscription. So beyond those numbers, they had reserves made up of all the men who'd been through the army system um, over the last decades. So you were still in the reserves in Germany, France and Austria into your 50s. So these people would be doing their two weeks training every year. And so the capability to top that up um, will become clear. Next, please. Um, picture of Germans marching about. Next. And we know what happened. Germany invaded Belgium. And the key point here is that Britain had a treaty guarantee um, to guarantee the the independence and security of Belgium coming out from the Napoleonic Wars, actually. Next. This is a German soldiers as part of that invasion into Belgium. Um, they, you can see the pointy hat on the top. That's a Pickelhaub helmet made. It's a leather helmet with a metal spike. Next, please. And lots of um, propaganda pictures about how badly the, the Germans were treating the Belgians. I mean, they did actually shoot Belgian civilians for no good reason. And this is an example into captivity, a scene in a Belgian town. Next, please. This is something I didn't know about until I went to a conference in Danoon a couple of years ago. The Bedford Highlanders. They have a pipe band in Bedford, a town just outside London. Next. And the territorial force is about defence against invasion. So it's not to be deployed, it's to go to the coast. And when the threat was seen to be from continental Europe and Germany, um, train loads of men in kilts headed south to Bedford. Next. and almost doubled the population, certainly doubled the number of men. Um, there are families in Bedford today who are proud of their connection to the Highlanders and um, men married local women. They went back to live with their sweethearts and wives. And even uh, some Bedford lads joined up, probably because the men in kilts were getting the girls. Next. These are pictures from the time. Don't worry, I'm quite comfortable at Bedford because they were billeted wherever. They were stuck in all sorts of places. And um, you can see the gun section, the 8th uh, Battalion. That, at the time in 1914, an infantry battalion had two machine guns, a thousand men with two machine guns. That changes very quickly. There's a parade for the king at the top and various other things happening. Um, next, please. Um, the Seventh Battalion volunteers to serve overseas. Um, there are a number of these battalions um, from different parts of Scotland. The Eighth Battalion came from Argyle and the Isles and spoke Gaelic. That's where the Oran Aras poem comes from. And the Fifth and Sixth, particularly the Fifth, came from Paisley. And the men who were real Highlanders thought it was ridiculous that they should be treated as 
uh, Highlanders with kilts and hated them and they would fight them and there would be brawls every time. And one of the issues underlying that, apart from just this cultural thing, was that Paisley would send extra clothing from the clothing factories in Paisley and from the cigarette factories, they'd send cigarettes to their boys. So their boys were getting extra things. But the 7th Battalion, which is the one from around here, um, volunteered to go to France because of the, the losses in the, as the, the BEF were wasted away. Uh, probably the best infantry soldiers at the time uh, wasted a silly activity. But next, please. That's them getting on the trains going to France. Next. So back to that chart of there, and then the next one, please. So they, the Continental Armies double fairly easily, but the British Army and the Empire forces go from a quarter of a million to eight and a half million. Um, so that's a, a remarkable achievement. Next, please. And it started out with Kitchener next. Um, Kitchener, Britain, your country wants you. And this is the famous picture where no matter where you move your, move your head. And he's always looking at you. Next, please. So asking for volunteers. Right at the very beginning, it was not many people came forward. It was only when bad news started to come through. But then large numbers started coming forward. So almost half a million in the first couple of months. Um, by 1915, two and a half million had volunteered, and they were formed into service battalions. Thank next. And these are the kinds of scenes and posters that were used. Um, this is the life for a Scotsman. Remember Belgium. There's room for you in list today. Next. So it goes from less than a quarter of a million to nine and a, eight and a half million. Next. At the Janoon conference I referred to, somebody, one of the historians, talked about three different armies, and I thought that was quite interesting. The regulars are the first and second battalions, with the third and fourth as reserve, largely volunteer type forces. Then there's the territorial force that we've been talking about, the 5th, the 6th from Paisley, the 7th from here, the 8th and 9th. And then from the Kitchener armies, the service battalions, 10, 11, 12, 14 in the front line, and then another four doing the training and supply. Next, please. I'd like to touch on this. The British Army had been technically very um, forward thinking. This equipment is worn on the shoulders and the hips. So it's like a modern rucksack. And if you look to the right, you can see the water bottle that's covered in cloth. And the water bottle, if you wet the cloth, the, the evaporation cools the water. Um, underneath that is an entrenching tool. So he has a shovel that he's carrying with him with a wooden handle that you can screw onto it. On the left you can see that little mess tin, that, the thing that's further out, and that's three dishes, one that you can eat from and two that you can cook from, cook with. And he's got a cloth hat, but then everybody at the time had a cloth hat. And he has um, ammunition clips on his chest. If you look at the next illustration, That's what the French went to war looking like. So red trousers, which were said to be important to the, for the morale of the men, red hats, and bits and pieces strung over them compared to the way the, the British soldiers are in camouflage and have um, well-distributed equipment around their body. Next. The reenactor on the right is showing a a kilt cover, a canvas kilt cover. The division 
the Argyles and the 51st Highland Division fought in kilts the whole time. Uh, I don't think they liked it much because um, you get lice in the pleats and if it's raining and you fall in a shell hole, the kilt floats and you sink. So when you climb out, the inside of the kilt is soaking wet and people's knees get cut and all that stuff. Um, you look at the, uh, the front of the reenactor on the right, the clips, the, the pouches he's got, I've got clips of rifle ammunition, so ready to, to, to reuse, to use. And he's wearing a helmet. The helmet isn't intended to stop a bullet. Remember I mentioned sh shrapnel earlier on. Um, if a shell goes off over her head, the, or um, an explosive with, sh with shrapnel that falls down and a metal hat like that will help you. Um, if a high explosive shell goes off nearby, then all the rubbish and the rocks will fall down on you. And if you've just got a cloth hat or a Glengarry or a Tama Shanta, then it will fall on your head. The Highland soldiers on the left with the illustration, you see the Argyle soldier on the both of the infantry soldier Argyles in that illustration, but you can see how the Scottish soldier looked a little different, or the Highland soldier looked a little different. The officer is wearing a true trousers because often the officers would be on horseback. It would give them uh, more mobility and uh, greater vision from being higher up. Next, please. One of the most touching items in the Argyles Museum, it always seemed to me, was the Silver War Badge. It says, for king and empire for services rendered. And men could wear it on their lapel uh, because women would abuse them as cowards. Uh, all throughout the war, this never stopped. And um, the, the, the argument was, why are you here when my brother or my husband or my father is at the front? You look perfectly fit and you can point to his war badge. Next. This is a very touching story. Um, the 8th Battalion, the one in the Western Isles that I mentioned. One of the officers was John Lauder. This is a promotional postcard to encourage people to join up in the territorial force before the war. Um, Harry Lauder's son. And Harry Lauder had moved from Glasgow, I think, uh, Lanarkshire, to live in the Western Isles. And he had his, I think he called it his Mawihus. Next, please. And he died in 1916. That's him on the left and right. Now, Harry Lauder is the most, um, the highest paid entertainer in the world at the time. And um, he was told his son had been killed while he was on stage and he continued with the, the show. Next, please. After his son had been killed, he wrote to keep right on to the end of the road. Every road through life is a long, long road, filled with joys and sorrows too. As you journey on, how your heart will yearn for the things most dear to you. With wealth and love tis so, but onward we must go. I'll let you read the rest. Next, please. Uh, Lauder went on to encourage recruitment into the army um, and to set up charity that raised a large sum of money for veterans. Um, but it shows the, the attitudes of the time that a man could lose his son and then write that lyric and become so committed to the cause that he would encourage others to join up. Next. When we go to schools, we talk about um, what life in the trenches are like, or what we're like. How would I know? I've never been in the army. I've never lived on the ground. 
um, we talked to them about um, imagine if you dug a hole in your garden and lived in it uh, for a few days. But the structure of the trench is something that's worth thinking about. There's no man's land on the left between your trenches and the Germans. There's a listening post at the end of a sap. That's that long finger going dug out into the middle. There's the front line trench, then a communication trench. You see, they're, they're all zigzag. That's because if a shell lands in the trench, it doesn't blast everything all the way along. It just blasts the small layer before it hits the wall. There's a parapet in front of the, the soldier and a parados behind because you don't think there's going to be an explosion behind and it could hit you in the back of your head. Um, a support trench, headquarters dug out, and then a trench back to the reserve trench. Next, please. So that's the sort of cross section that we'd look at. You can see the parados behind is higher than the parapet. And sandbags are important because they stop a bullet. A bullet will go through a brick wall or a concrete structure, but it won't go through a sandbag. And the duckboard is to keep the feet above the mud and the filth. Next, please. But contrary to what um, people perceive, the soldiers didn't spend an awful lot of time in that firing line. So it's three, four, five days in the month in that front line, and then in the, the support trench, then in the reserve trench, and almost half the time out of the trenches. So the, the way it's portrayed is that it's this miserable existence living in the front line. Um, it was pretty miserable existence, but they weren't all in the front line. Next, please. So half a month. So what you've got then is hygiene with baths, hot meals, delousing and laundry. There's then training and there's extra work. So one of the issues later in the war is that people are being put to tasks that are work tasks, not training tasks, but practicing attacks out of the line. A big thing was recreation. So there's concert parties, um, there's football, Highland Games, and local cafes to buy your bottle of plonk. And people got about 10 days every year as leave. And the, the leave started from France or Flanders. And so you had 10 days to get back. And if you lived in Kent, you had more time at home than if you lived in Argyle. Next. There's Highland Games pictures between battalions in the division, which is always something that's been important. And the classic throwing the hammer, tossing the caber and dancing. I have no idea what the game on the bottom right is. It looks like throwing the smallest man as far as you can get him. Next. This is an over the top illustration. So that picture in the middle, the color picture is in the museum and um, we have the whistles, the officers whistle in the museum as well. And um, on the school visits, we'll often play, blow the whistle very loudly and it gets them all to shut, to shut up and start moving forward. The bottom right picture is an interesting one. It's pipers who would jump out of the trench. Over a thousand pipers were killed in the war. And at the back end, I think September 1916, the War Office banned that practice and said they had to stay in the trench until the infantry had moved out um, because the losses of pipers were so great. Remember, the pipes are a weapon of war, so they didn't carry any guns. They just carried their pipes. Next, please. I'll talk about the... There's lots of ways of thinking about the technical changes. War is famous for driving technology. Um, next, please. The developments in artillery are remarkable in terms of thinking about it. In 1914, um, artillery units were based in these batteries and the horses took them in front of the enemy and they fired over open sites just exactly as had happened 
at Blenheim or Waterloo or any other earlier battle. So they were slightly better guns, but the technology was the same. Next, please. In 19, by 1916, um, there's ranging using sound, watching for the flashes, but there's aerial photography and aircraft would fly um, in the morning, take photographs. These would be processed and being used the same afternoon. This is mid late 1916. Be used in the afternoon to plan artillery missions. And this is about, what was it, 15 years after the first, 1903 was the first flight, 1903. So we're looking at um, uh, 12 years or something um, for, these, for this to be happening. It's remarkable. And the big issue for, for the Royal Flying Corps was not operating fighter squadrons, which is what you'd think if you watch Aces High or any of these other films. They were flying fighters to protect the f the planes taking the photographs. It was all about photography to plan missions, and they would, knowing that the, the fighter planes that the Germans had were better, um, they would still get up and fly because of their loyalty to the infantry that they were trying to help with these photographs that were being taken by the aircraft they were trying to protect. In 1917, the barrage was invented, and that's um, artillery that's firing specifically in front of the infantry battalion as it moves forward. And the barrage moves forward at the same pace as the infantry. And as it crosses over the enemy trench, before they can get out, up and out and get the machine gun ready, the infantry, the British infantry, are there on top of them. That's not what happened at the Somme, obviously, in 1916, but that's the improvement. Then we have, in, by 1918, this predicted fire from big guns using measurement, maths, physics, so you didn't even need to make ranging shots. Measuring the precise diameter of each barrel uh, measuring the air temperature, air pressure, wind direction, and the uh, the British artillery were able to uh, f time the firing of individual barrels so that the shells all landed at the same time. No ranging shots, no warning, no nothing. It must have been absolutely terrifying for the Germans. But think about it: we've gone from horse-drawn batteries firing at targets you can see. Uh, within less than four years to um, using measurement and detailed uh, mass and physics to land shells on a precise location. Next, please. Next, please. And you could land shells fired from Talibody on a specific target in Dunblane. Next, please. This is the end of the war, the Hundred Days, the Kaiser's Battle, the Kaiser Schlacht. Next. Um, when the communists took over in Russia and the Germans agreed a, a, a treaty with them, which was an extremely harsh treaty, it showed the way they would have treated Belgium or France if they'd won the war. Um, it liberated a huge number of soldiers. And so they were able to move to the Western Front. Next, please. Led to the Spring Offensive, and it was the nearest the German came, Germans came to a decisive breakthrough. Some people say it could have won the war. I'm not sure about that, but it could have. Next. The, the British Fifth Army and British Third Army. Um, if you're making an attack, uh, it's always good to go for the junction of any two forces, um, whatever it is, a battal two battalions, two corps, two armies, because it becomes confusing who's in charge of that bit. 
So if, you, if the German attack at the junction of 5th and 3rd, then is 5th Army responsible for that or is 3rd Army responsible for that? And the idea, Ludendorff's idea, was to cut through and then turn north to Cali next week. This is what happened. They punched through. They, they continued going to the west. They didn't turn to Cali. They sort of lost focus. But you can see in the middle, the 5th Army under Goff has been pushed back quite considerably, whereas the 3rd Army under Bing uh, uh, is holding. So Goff is the one that his army is being pushed back strongly. Next, please. And we've got a little token of that. Murray's uh, famous graveyard tour uh, looks at the Titanic. William Moyes, who was the engineer officer who died on the Titanic because he stayed at his post to keep the generators running so the lights would stay on and they could continue to signal Morse. But his brother, Alexander, was an officer who was killed on the first day of that um, attack, the German Spring Offensive. Next. Um, one of the reasons why was that Haig was concerned about uh, his northern side, northern front, because of the needs for supply coming in from Britain. And Plumer's army had 23 miles with 14 divisions, whereas Goff had 42 miles with 12 divisions. So Goff's much more thinly spread. Next. And it was years later, I, I, I was in Paisley in the 1970s, and somebody would often say, my name's Goff and I'm off. And I could never work out what that was about. Um, the 6th Paisley Battalion was in the 3rd Army and they would mock um, the 5th Army for retreating with, my name's Goff and I'm off. Next, please. Next, please. Um, the um, British were trying to have defence in depth, but they didn't, want, they didn't do it right. They had forward battle and rear as their idea. Um, but it finished up with 43 German divisions to Goff's 12. Next. That's Germans advancing. And you can see again, that's Goff getting pushed back. Next. One of the innovations that the Germans brought was stormtroopers, where they had specific groups of soldiers with machine guns, flamethrowers, um, grenades, who were trained to bypass strong points and attack um, and into the British positions. Next, please. They called it Operation Michael. Um, we can see the number of guns, uh, the BAF casualties, Goff got sacked. But what the stormtroopers really did was shift the problem to the breakout. Next, please. Because they can break in, but they can't break out. And these are two stretcher bearers. They're a bit tired after all that fighting. Next, please. SB is for stretcher to be. When the attack ran out of puff, it was misdirected that it was basically just the German generals flailing about. They didn't have a real plan. The British had a plan, though, and that's known as the 100 days. Next, please. Um, the untenable salients were crushed. Uh, the BAF finally got reinforced. You'll remember that Lloyd George. Uh, didn't want to send any more soldiers, and so he's keeping back uh, the new recruits. Um, but mixing the units together, they managed to create this mix of enthusiasm and experience. Next. And there's Highland soldiers advancing. Next. 
Um, the 8th of August was a watershed battle. Uh, British staff planning at this stage was so good that they could move an entire army corps from one end of the front to the other uh, without anybody knowing about it. And they set up an attack, an infantry attack by Australian and Canadian Corps. And they were best suited for it because they had more engineers um, and, and basically stronger units. Uh, the British Army had thinned out its units. The artillery all fired together using the old maths and physics that I talked about. And they, this attack advanced eight miles in one day. And the morale effect on the Germans was horrendous. Ludendorff said it was the black day of the German. Next. So we had, a, at the beginning, um, men in cloth caps, um, two machine guns per battalion, and moving forward in lines. And here we have uh, battle groups, men in helmets, armoured vehicles, tanks, lorries, aircraft, bombers, reconnaissance aircraft, and machine guns at platoon level, and all arms battle. Next, please. And that's the clearing out um, of German positions. The, the terrain there, around there is uh, chalk, and the trenches are dug into chalk. And so the piles of white you see either side are the, the soil that's dug out. Uh, so it's not that there's a special white feature that's been introduced, it's just that's, that's what it is under the, ground, under the grass. Next. So the 100 days offensive pushed back from that red line to the red dotted line. And um, then the Germans surrendered. And the uh, Allies then were given these little blue zones to occupy in Germany that you can see. Next. Uh, the, fight, the biggest assault was on the St. Quentin Canal. Um, that's a million shells, um, more than in, at the Somme over a 13 mile frontage. Next, please. That's the 7th Argyles, the unit that we started talking about at the beginning at St. Quentin. Next. Um, an average territorial division broke the Hindenburg line. They used life belts, would you believe, from the channel steamers to swim across the canal. Next. And that's them. So they went down one side of the bank, swam across with the life belts, climbed up the other side and attacked. And that's the Where's Wally? photograph of the infantry brigade that did it as part of that division. Next. Next. One of the issues that always seemed to me was that um, the German public didn't see a victory. They didn't see they were beaten because these little blue zones were the only places the Allies went. Uh, but it was a remarkable victory. Um, because they didn't see British soldiers marching through the centre of Berlin in a victory parade. Then we finished up with Adolf Hitler. Next, please. Um, these are the guys that won the war. Um, I think British generals are given a, a, a hard time and they're portrayed as being uh, cowardly back in the, the chateau. Uh, the guy in the middle at the front is the Scotsman Haig. The, there's over 200 British generals killed or wounded in the First World War, in the Great War, um, because they were not doing what they should have been doing, which is staying to the rear and managing things. They were desperate to get to the front. Um, the casualty levels are, are, are remarkable. Uh, it's just... It's... I mean, they, they might not have been the brightest guys, but they were the best guys at the time, and they won it. Next, please. So Haig set up the Royal British Legion, and it's still supporting today's veterans. Next, please. 
Um, the centenary of the RS battle in 2017, I went up to the Wallace Monument and there's all this, there's very evocative poppies being dropped down from the front. Uh, the commemorations are all about dead people. Um, whereas 90% of the soldiers survived. Next, please. The, if you've never been to these uh, war graves, it's very evocative. You can walk on the ground that these men walked on and you can see people your own age, uh, not my own age, but, um, teenagers, people in their 20s, 30s, and the regimental badge is very, very evocative. Next, please. Ninety percent came home alive. Um, so let's say ten or eleven percent overall overall death rate. Um, it was much higher for officers. Um, Seventeen percent or eighteen percent or something like that, because the officers were expected to jump up first and lead the way. And the uh, death rate from Eton was twice that of the. Um, the total army. That's my story. That's it. That's back to the Argyle Glengarry, and I hope you enjoyed it. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to unmute everybody at once, and if I can get a big round of applause, uh, I'm mute. So. <laughs> All right, so I'll pop everybody back on to mute. Uh, Thank you. And, oh, uh, uh, yeah. Okay, so uh, we'll go for the Q&A session. So if anybody has got a question for Jim, if you can raise your hand, and then I'll uh, go on to unmute you. We'll start with you, David. Right, thanks very much. First of all, Jim, I'd like to say it was a fantastic lecture. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Can you hear me all right? I don't know if he can. Um, I'm mute. I'm mute. Yeah. There we go. Oh, yes, wait. I can. Ah, that's right. I just wanted to say, Jim, that was a fantastic lecture. Uh, I, th I thoroughly enjoyed that. There's just a couple of points I'd just like, uh, like to, well, one or two points I'd just like to raise. I was very interested in what you said about Bedford because I've never heard of that before. Now, yeah. I, I'm a member of the Holy Trinity Episcopal Church in Stirling, and we have a war memorial that commemorates 50 fatalities from World War I, eh, of whom 22 are Argyles. Eight, for 18, we have the battalion information, are split over eight battalions. Um, but, and I would thoroughly agree with you that those who died are far better documented than those who survived. But I have a Stanley Steve, Private Stanley Stevens whose place of enlistment is, is, is draw, drawn from the Commonwealth War Graves Commission records as Bradford. But I just wonder if that could be a transcription error for Bedford. And he has a home address in Stirling, 12 Abbey Road. So that's one that I will definitely look into on the basis of this lecture. Secondly, uh, you mentioned the Western Isles. As, as far as I'm aware, the regiment in the Western Isles was the Seaforth Highlanders. And that's certainly who dominates the, the war memorial in Stornoway. I think if the Argyles were drawn in, in, in number from any islands, it's more likely to be in the inner islands of Mull, Isla, Jura, Gia, etc. Yeah. Uh, certainly it's, when, you're right. It's, it, it's more Isla than the, the, than, the wet, than the outer isles. It's more, uh, more the inner Hebrides. It's just Western Isles. Everybody thinks to th tends to think of uh, Lewis Harris, the Uists etc. And that's definitely Seaforth territory. The other thing is, and I'm sure this was a slip of the tongue, you said about the, the Argyles at the Thin Red Line, as far as I'm aware it was the Sutherlands. Um, oh yeah, it's, and, it's uh, the 2nd Battalion. Ah, uh, yeah. So, so as the two battalions came together, they, they adopted that as part of their heritage. I was, was, the, was, the, was the Crimea not before the amalgamation? Yes, but 
the the regiment's history takes uh -huh. the history of the two battalions, the, uh -huh. the two original regiments, the 91st and the 93rd, uh -huh. and they combine them. Right. So right. They, they both get to claim the credit of the well, other. I've got you. So they'll both they'll share, well, it's the one regiment, so it's the one battle honour. And lastly, the American, the yeah. general is very interested by the references to the American Civil War, because I know that the, the Sterling Journal in particular was a very, very strong supporter of the Confederate side in, in, the, in, this, in, in the American Civil War. And that's true right the, way th right the way through the whole war. And I found that quite surprising. Uh, so there was perhaps a Confederate influence. Uh, and I do know that there was a Confederate agent who lived in Bridge of Allen. But uh, anyway, that's the last for me. Fantastic lecture, Jim, that's given me a lot to think about. Thank you very much. The, the, I think we have the, the conceit of ourselves that we were always on the side of the, the north um, yeah. in Scotland because we're, we're basically good people. Yes. But um, I think the truth is that we were strongly in favour of the south. Yes. Thanks very much, Jim. Thank you, David, for that question. Uh, if I could see a uh, raise of hands for anyone else that's got a question, I'll look round the room. Uh, sure. Yes, Jim, I, a very interesting talk. Uh, it's uh, evoking an awful lot of different uh, emotions there. Uh, you were mentioning at the beginning there that uh, the Germans started off with the Pickelhaub uh, helmets, and then we see them later on with what we associate more with the Germans, uh, the sort of the, the chanty style hat that they, or tin helmet that they wore. When did that change, do you know? That's a good question. Um, I don't know, but it was, it tended, as far as I can remember, it's late 15, early 16, because what people realized that having soft hats when there's stuff falling down on you is not a good idea. And so that the various armies introduced metal helmets for the, uh, about the same time the French just adopted the one that the, the fire brigade used the British designed one and the Germans designed one um, and one of the odd things is that um, head wounds became more common in at least in the British army but almost certainly in the Germans as well and um, senior officers start saying giving them these helmets is a bad idea because it just means they stick their head up and they get shot because the bullet will go through the front it won't stop anything um but that's reading the statistics the wrong way around it was that before that person would have been dead because they got a piece of shrapnel through their head and now they've survived so it's always an interesting one it's a bit like they didn't give them parachutes because they thought they'd be too filthy to jump out and they would all be jumping out. Yeah, yeah. Uh, another question, just while we were talking about uh, how the helmets were more for shrapnel than they were for bullets, uh, you very briefly mentioned sniping, that uh, sniping in the First World War was actually quite a big part of what the army did. And it's interesting to note that a, a local man in Stirling was Major F. M. Crum. Uh, he had been in the army for many years, uh, the Boer War in particular, and he was actually one of the front runners in sniping in the British Army. Uh, I don't know right. if you've got a record of that up at the, the, the Argyle Museum or not. It's not, I don't think it's there, but um, one of the things that is there is a modern, or it was there, it's, it's being re rearranged now, obviously. Um, but there was a, a modern soldier's uniform with a ghillie suit. And of course, the ghillie suit has become um, the standard outfit for snipers, but it was invented just up the road. All right, was that the, the Lord Lovett one? The, yeah, the ghillie, the, I mean, the, the, the thing with all the stripe, strips and stripes of fabric to, to break up the lines. Yeah. Um, because a, a ghillie, you know, if you if you went if you're a gentleman and you went hunting, you would have a ghillie with you, and he would have a ghillie suit, and the snipers okay. adopted that. And yeah. another 
other countries took the British sniper ghillie suit thing and went for it. Yeah, uh, Crum, Crum actually was involved in sniping because he had seen it uh, so effectively used uh, during the Boer War by the Boers and yeah. transferred it to uh, the British Army in the First World War. But thank you, very, very interesting talk. Thank you. Over to you, Rose. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you very much for the question. Uh, um, I've got another question, so just, uh, David Spooner there, I'll mute you. Hi, um, you just mentioning about sniping reminded me when I was last in the museum at the castle, that for me, one of the most poignant entries was the, um, the replica of the, the trenches. And there was a story taken from a German sniper's diary of him being ordered to shoot the piper and how yeah. he hated to do it and he heard the music die as he shot and that such a poignant memory it's it just brought it right back you're talking about the the sniper there um but the question i wanted to yeah. ask uh jim was do you know if there's been any or uh, what involvement there may have been with the argyll and sutherland highlanders at the prisoner of war camp up at Kinloch Leven, if there was any, because I've seen photographs of um, German soldiers still in their trench coats and still with their pointed hats being offloaded at the head of Loch Leven to be marched up to the camp. And I wondered which regiment might have been involved. I, I don't know. I okay. don't know. Um, I've looked through the war diaries and I don't remember that coming out from anything um but i don't know it could be it could be more um like the the rear echelon units rather than the the front line units i can't imagine they would be using or maybe just training units because stirling was being used as a training center for for all of the highland regiments at one stage okay thanks Thank you for the question, David. Uh, I've got a wee question for myself then, Jim. Um, what, actually, how long have you been at the museum? What got you involved uh, there? And what kind of things do you do when we're not in lockdown there? <laughs> um, we have, uh, we do a day a week. So there's two or three of us on each day and we can answer questions and lead people around and show them exhibits and interesting items. Um, if there's little children there, one of my favourites is the box of chocolates that was sent out uh, to mark the new year from the King and Queen. And one of these soldiers sent the chocolates back home, in, still in the tin box. So lots of regiment museums have got the tin box, but the Argyles one has got the chocolates because <laughs> he sent them home for his sister to have and the family kept some of the chocolates. So they're still there in the silver pack, silver wrappers. It's lovely. Yeah, that's nice. Cherry on the top of the chocolate. Eh, <laughs> uh, I've, uh, I've, I've got any other questions uh, for Jim? Uh, I'll have another look around the room. So just raise your hand if you do. Uh, don't see any. No. Okay. That's well, fine. I think that's us. So uh, again, I just want to say a massive thank you, Jim, uh, for a very interesting talk. That was. Excellent. I will go through and unmute everybody for the final round of applause uh, for your time. Thank you very much. And um, we will also enjoy the rest of the summer. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye, all. Bye. 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 For the things most dear to you. With wealth and love it's so, but onward we must go. Keep right on to the end of the road, keep right on to the end. Though the way be long, let your heart be strong, keep right on round the bend. If you're tired and weary, still journey on till you come to your happy abode. Where all your love and your dreaming of will be there at the end of the road. With a big stout heart to a long steep hill, we may get there.
of a smile With a good, kind thought and a name in view We can cut short many a mile So let courage every day be your guiding star away. Keep right on to the end of the road. Keep right on to the end. Though the way be long, let your heart be strong. Keep right on round the bend. If you're tired and weary, Journey on till you come to your happy 